Professor Wilkins, our friends from the Harvard Law School, Professor uh, Madhav Menon, the father, of, indeed the father of legal, legal education in India, Professor Khanna, Professor Rajkumar, my beloved parents, ladies and gentlemen. As I entered this hall this evening, Professor Wilkins said to me, there are three generations of Narimans here in this room. So I said, that brings to mind the famous judgment of Justice Holmes in Buck versus Bell, where there was a compulsory sterilization law which he upheld. And he said, three generations of imbeciles is enough. <laughs> I might only say we have beaten Justice Holmes to it. There is a fourth generation as well. I am very proud to say that I belong to the Campus Law Center of Delhi, which has <laughs> produced one third of the judges of the Supreme Court today. It's an amazing number of judges who have come from that center. And let me tell you, we were very fortunate. I joined in the year 1976 after a Bachelor of Commerce course, as Professor Wilkins was pointing out, we had to first do a bachelor course and then do a postgrad degree. But we were very fortunate because we had the aftermath of Professor Arthur Taylor von Meren coming here and the Campus Law Center imbibing a lot from the Harvard Law School. In those days, it was called the case law method, the Socratic method of teaching, etc. And in a major departure from the other law schools of the day, we had a semester system in which we were taught 30 subjects, finally. And each subject toted up for the final grade that you would get in the LLB examination. Now, I must tell you, that the student body of those days was not great. The reason being, it was very easy to get into law college in those days. However, the teachers who were imbued with this new spirit from overseas were by and large excellent. What was equally excellent and of as much importance as the teachers was the curriculum. Why I say this is, it is very important to be taught something which is interesting, as opposed to be taught the subject in all its details. I give you an example. In our contract class, for example, we started off with the famous case of Khalil versus the Kabbalic smoke ball company. Now, I was not taught by Professor Kingsfield because I didn't act in paper chase. I was taught by Professor Mulchan Sharma, who was one of the new young recruits. However you teach that case, the facts themselves are so interesting that that case grips your attention and never leaves you. It has never left me. We were always taught in the contract class to read sections two onwards, which made little sense at the time. But when we were taught this particular case, what was brought to the fore was the fact that you could have an offer, not from an individual to another individual, but an offer made to the entire world. As you know, there was an advertisement. And the facts there were so peculiar until one discovered later in life that there was an influencer epidemic before this particular case was tried, in which thousands of people were killed in England. With this background, the facts became a little more intelligible. Because the advertisement was very peculiar. It said, we, the Carbolic Smokeball Company, will offer anybody 
who takes our product and sniffs it for three days or three times a day for two weeks and then does not contract influenza. Most peculiar. Now, apparently Mrs. Carlil sniffed the smoke ball for over two weeks and yet contracted influenza. And the question was whether this 100 pound offer was actually accepted by her by conduct and whether a contract was formed and whether there was consideration for the contract. Another interesting fact which was pointed out at the time, which didn't exactly strike us as students but which struck us later, was that a thousand pounds was kept in a bank account, which all the Lord Justices said was to see that we are serious about the offer we are making. So that if persons do come forward and say they contracted influenza, here is the 100 pound from the bank account. The bench consisted of two persons who later became master of the rules, which is the chief of the court of appeals. And all three judges delivered judgment and ultimately held, yes, there was a binding contract. There was an offer. The offer could be made to the world. There was acceptance by conduct. There was consideration for the reason that the person actually inhaled the carbolic acid and by inhaling that acid ultimately caused benefit to the company because they had to purchase the equipment which costed 10 shillings in those days. So finally all the elements of contract were laid down and we were taught this case of course by a professor who was young and who was most enthusiastic at the time. But why I am laboring on this case is that a curriculum should be so designed as to have cases like Carlin. It's not important what you teach, but how you teach it. Because what you teach is forgotten. How you teach it never goes. And once you kindle that interest in a student, the student will not only go and reread ultimately what you have taught it or taught him but will further go on and perhaps expand his reading into areas which he would never have. So the idea really of a curriculum which is very very important is that you have cases which catch your interest so that however average the teacher ultimately the case makes up for it or for him. Another interesting case that comes to mind, which again was taught in the contract class, was Bhagwan Das Kedia's case. Now, that is another judgment where there were two views, and this is one other very interesting and important method of teaching a law student, that look, there are two views, perhaps there can be a third view, and you can come out with it, so it stimulates interest again. Here again we had Section 4 of our 1872 Contract Act, which came up for consideration by the court. Incidentally, our Contract Act was based, apart from being based on the English common law, was based on Dudley Field's draft New York Code of 1860. As you all know, Dudley Field was an outstanding attorney who made drafts of various codes, including a criminal code, civil code, etc. Now the civil code consisted of sections which were property, contract, etc. And we picked up a lot from that code, including section 4. Field belonged to a remarkable family because his younger brother Stephen Field became a justice of the United States Supreme Court. He was the only justice who was the 10th justice of the United States Supreme Court appointed by President Lincoln. Otherwise, you've had nine or less than nine, but never ten. Congress at that point apparently had a tenth seat available. He was peculiar in two other things as well. Apart from the famous shooting incident with another judge, and uh, ultimately the other judge got killed by his Batman, but that apart, 
he served for the longest period until Justice Douglas broke his record. And there was an interesting story told about him, that when he was old and pretty senile, the first John Marshall Harlan went to him and tried to tell him that, look, you, perhaps you should step down. And this is something that you told Justice Greyer years and years ago. So the old man looked at him, scowled, and said, yeah, and I never did a dirtier day's work in my life. <laughs> and that was that. So the result was Stephen Field continued until he beat John Marshall's record and became the longest serving justice at the time, beaten only by Justice Douglas years and years later. Now coming back to our Bhagwan Das Kedia's judgment, section four of our act states that an offer is accepted when it is put in the post to an acceptor who is an individual and said to be accepted when it is put into the course of transmission so as to be out of his power to retract it. And the question which arose there was as to whether the section would apply even in the case of a contract made over the telephone. And the argument made was that a telephone is a means of instantaneous communication. There is no third party agency once you are put on the line. Unlike a letter being put into the post and the post office is considered the agent of the offerer because he's put it into the post and as that agent now is the collection agent, the contract obviously becomes complete at the time that the acceptor puts it into the course of transmission back to the proposer. And the question was which court would therefore have jurisdiction? The court at Ahmedabad where the offer in that sense was received and assented to or the court at a place called Khamgao where the thing was put into transmission by the acceptor. And by a two-to-one judgment, it was held that the section would not apply to contracts which are not by post. Justice Hidayatullah dissented, went into the law in all the other nations in great detail and ultimately said that this is a section of 1872 vintage. Parliament has not thought fit to amend it. Parliament therefore knows that the telephone has come up meanwhile and not thought it fit to amend it. The section is not limited to contracts by post and therefore, sorry, it is Khamgao which has jurisdiction and not Ahmedabad. Now it is cases like this which again stimulate your interest. So what is important in setting down a curriculum is to have cases of the kind of Carlil which have peculiar facts which bring out the law or Judgments which have more than one point of view, which again, therefore, lead to the person getting interested in what you are saying and then going and studying for himself. This is one very important suggestion I wish to make, that just as the student body and the teacher teaching are important, the curriculum is equally important and needs to be laid down by persons of the eminence of Professor Madhav Menon. So it is not merely the subject that you are speaking about. There are so many new subjects which you adverted to. New subjects will keep coming in. The point is how do you hold the interest of the student in whichever subject you are teaching so that ultimately when he graduates from law school, he is much more learned in the, in the real sense than another student who has merely parroted something for an examination, walked out and forgotten everything. So this is one suggestion which I may make from my own experience in this great campus law center. To come to my experience now in the Harvard Law School. When I joined Harvard, I wished to and did in fact major in US constitutional law. So what I did was I took a course with Richard Parker in general constitutional law. I took a course with Tony Lewis in constitution and the press 
and of course with Derek Bell in constitution and minority issues. And apart from these causes, I did my paper which had two credits which Archi with Archibald Cox. Now, Archibald Cox, as all of you know, was the Solicitor General of Kennedy and the special Watergate prosecutor of Nixon who got fired because he was doing his job. The old man was deaf in one year. So I had to always sit on one particular side, otherwise he couldn't hear me. And the subject I chose for my paper was how India treated its downtrodden, that is the untouchable, as opposed to how the US treated the black through case law. Now, inevitably, I was much more interested in the American side. Professor Cox was interested in our side. So he was trying to learn from me, and I was desperate to learn the other side. So every time we met, he would ask me about the latest case law in India. And I would try and discuss Dred Scott with him, or Plessy versus Ferguson with him. Eh, you're not interested. So I was pretty much left on my own when it came to the US Constitution in that area. But again, your history fascinated me so much that much after Harvard, I've kept up with reading of US case law and, the, and your constitution. And it wasn't at Harvard that I learned that you actually had slavery provisions in the constitution. That's something that I didn't know and that I picked up only much later, reading around the subject. Now, Chief Justice Taney, who decided Dred Scott, had a Parsi connection. I don't know if any of you know this. Chief Justice Taney had a brother-in-law who was Francis Scott Keyes. Francis Scott Keyes composed Star Spangled Banner. Where did he compose Star Spangled Banner? on a Parsi ship, the HMS Minden. Now, it was built by the master builders, the Wadia builders in Surat, and was parked in Chesapeake Bay during the Anglo-American War of 1812. And this man went to negotiate some kind of a truce with the British, went on board the ship, had this fabulous visitation, composed the anthem and came down the next day. But getting back to Chief Justice Taney, who was much vilified because of Dred Scott, on reading the, these slavery provisions in the Constitution, I, I am not at all sure that he was wrong. You see, you had in the original Constitution, article, and as you know, your Constitution is beautiful in its simplicity. There are only seven articles, and each one deals with a specified subject. Now, Article 1, which deals with Congress, first deals with the House of Representatives, the lower house. And in Article 1, subclause 2, subclause 3, you have a very peculiar provision when it comes to the state's representation in the House of Representatives, together with taxes that are apportioned by Congress to the states. And here, something very peculiar happened. The southern states who had slavery wanted to count the Negro. Because if they counted the Negro as among, among the persons to be counted, their representation in the House of Representatives went up. And the amount of taxes that they got also went up. So the compromise that was reached was very, very peculiar. The Negro is regarded as three-fifths of a person. So you have, therefore, when you count for this purpose, every free man as one. The important thing is the expression free man as one. And all others as three-fifths. So this is one indicator that the federal constitution did not consider the Negro as equivalent to a free man first. Second, equally in Article 1, the same article, subclause 9, for 20 years, the slave trade was something that was allowed. 
so that when you had, and of course it was masked by using the word labor. So you may have immigrant or immigrant labor, which is nothing but slaves being brought in for a period of 20 years after which it would stop. And third, under Article 4 again, subclause 2, again, little 3. If a slave ran away, it was, it's called the fugitive clause, ran away from state A to state B, his master could get him back to state A. Now, if you read these provisions together, and then you read the Missouri Compromise, which was struck down in Dred Scott, you would probably say it's correctly struck down. And Justice Curtis, who was there for a very short period, who dissented, basically dissented on a ground which didn't involve the US Constitution at all. He said that you had states among the 13 states who treated the Negro as a citizen and also gave him in some states the right to vote. If this were so, then obviously it is something which shows that America treated the Negro as a free citizen, as a person who's, who could be a citizen, who is a citizen in some states, and who also had the right to vote. But that was hardly the question. Question was, how did the federal constitution treat this man? So, in hindsight, now that my interest was kindled and I saw these provisions, and then reread Dred Scott, I am not at all sure that just Chief Justice Taney was wrong in the judgment he gave. Of course, he's been resurrected. And as you know, he followed in the footsteps of the great John Marshall. And the other interesting thing about the great John Marshall and the equally great Earl Warren, much later, your two greatest Chief Justices, is the fact that they both became Chief Justices by happenstance. Chief Justice Marshall happened to be the Secretary of State of the second president, John Adams, and would have continued as such and then retired as such as the Adams administration came to an end, had John Jay, the first Chief Justice, said no to becoming Chief Justice again. He was confirmed by the Senate, mind you, and therefore should have become Chief Justice once again. But then when you look at John Jay's tenure, in six years, they decided only four cases, first six years. And in those six years, he spent a year as ambassador to England while being chief justice. So it wasn't an office that meant too much in those days. He then stepped down to become governor of New York, which he thought was a higher office than the chief justice. The reverse of Charles Evans Hughes who was governor of New York, then became chief judge, much, much later. So, it is this great John Marshall, who was appointed by the Adams administration only because Jay did not accept, and because the senior most judge, Patterson, Adams refused to appoint. So this man came in by happen happenstance, laid down US constitutional law as we know it, all the great decisions are his, starting from Marbury, going on to Fletcher versus Peck, going on to McCulloch and Maryland, going on to Gibbons and Ogden, etc., etc. I don't have time to speak about all of them. So when Tanny comes in, after this great Chief Justice and delivers Red Scott, and as you know, the Civil War was the result, Tanny got extremely vilified. And we then had the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to do away with Dred Scott. One other interesting thing that I, my reading gave me, and why I'm telling you all this is because my interest was kindled by taking up all these constitutional law causes, together with the paper I had to write for Archibald Cox, which led me to read this and then discover all this for myself. So that finally, I also discovered, as a, as a byway, that the 14th Amendment was not actually ratified by the necessary number of states. Three-fourths of the states have to ratify a constitutional amendment under Article 5. Ohio and New Jersey 
which ratified the 14th Amendment withdrew their ratifications. As a result of which it would become less than three-fourths. But somehow that didn't ever bother the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has since then acted on the supposition that the 14th Amendment exists and then you have case after case which has applied. Now, as opposed to all this, we started off on a fresh slate. In our constitution, bang, our slavery was abolished straight away. Our 13th Amendment is in Article 17. Second, our 14th Amendment is in Article 14 and Article 21. And of course, as you know, we've gone much further. Because not only do we abolish the kind of slavery that we've had here, which is really untouchability, but we have gone on to see that these people are rehabilitated and not just rehabilitated, but massive affirmative action programs have been given for them in terms of reservation and so forth, both in the legislatures as well as in government service. Now, the idea again of telling you all this is that there was enough interest kindled by our having been taught these courses. And of course, at that point of time, people would ask me, why are you doing these things? It has no direct practical application for you. One of the things Professor Wilkins pointed out here. I am a firm believer that practical, I don't like the word practical. Practical application has very little to do with education. I believe very strongly that you are educated in the real sense of the word only if you have read around your subject and much more than your subject. Because if you have read around your subject and much more than your subject, you will do your own subject far better than anybody else. I am a firm believer in this. So, one of the answers I would give you is, damn practicality. I am not interested in practicality. Give persons the kind of education which stimulates them. And stimulus is to be found, as I said earlier, in curriculum, first and foremost. Stimulus is to be found in top class teachers, which is a rarity. Now, unfortunately, these days, I am told that top class teachers are a rarity only because we have not followed what the first law commission told us to do, which is we must have permanent teaching staff. You can't have people on contract. It is only when you have permanent teaching staff who are trainable. And here is where you people come in. Harvard comes in, other universities come in. One suggestion by me is perhaps you should have an academy like the Judicial Academy in Bhopal. You have the same thing for teachers. And you pick up the brightest in each institution, from the highest to the lowest. Now, how do, how do you get to this brightest? You have students evaluate the teacher. And the students can then evaluate a teacher and say, yes, these are our two or three best. Pick them up. Get them trained at these centers. The training can be by persons overseas, by professionals, by judges, by all sorts. And these people can then go and infect their own kind with the correct legal education virus. That is one way out. So we have suggestions, therefore, which are, number one, student body. Today's student body is far better than the student body in my day. You have competitive examinations, which are reasonably difficult. Persons who get into the five-year law school are all, by and large, top-class persons. Maybe we can have similar examinations on a kind of model, which is followed by universities for other law students, both three years and five years. Maybe that's one other way out. So ultimately, when one looks at the problem as a whole, there are many things that need to be done and all need to be done together. Finally, I would only say this. Robert Benchley was a great humorist. Had was once asked to discuss the fishing problem 
from the point of view of the great powers. So the answer he gave was, I know nothing whatsoever about the fishing problem from the point of view of the great powers. Therefore, let me discuss the problem from the point of view of the fish. <laughs> I have been doing exactly that all along. I have been discussing this problem from the point of view of an ex-student. I have never been a teacher, unfortunately. Perhaps I will be one after I retire. But a lot needs to be done. I am sure the panel will give us a lot of interesting suggestions. Thank you all very much.